Hello, good morning, good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Asavari Manvikar. I would like to introduce you all, <clears throat> welcome you all uh, to the CAR Global Webinar Research Series. Council for Ayurveda Research is an international nonprofit organization based in USA with its sister chapter in India by the name Ayurvidya Anusandhan Abhiyan Foundation, AAAF. Our mission is to encourage, educate, and facilitate basic clinical and interdisciplinary research in Ayurveda. Our vision is to promote and establish Ayurveda as an evidence-based health science globally. You can learn more about us at www.ayurvedaresearchusa.org. Please do consider joining us as a member, uh, which will bring you access to all of our resources no nonprofit can really operate and succeed without the volunteers. So we would love you to participate. Consider joining us as a volunteer. We can place you in variety of projects based on your research, uh, your skills, and your interest. Once again, our website is www.ayurvedaresearchusa.org. Now let me introduce you to our platinum sponsor, Komal Herbals. It's a company based in Pennsylvania. It is focused as concept on concept of Ayurveda and the power of using healthy herbals and natural products. Komal Herbal work hard to find premium ingredients for their herbal formulations. They also source spices and herbs that are sustaining and originally organically grown around the world. For more information, go to komalherbals.com. Now let me introduce our eminent speaker today. Dr. Sumit Kumar is MD in Ayurveda. He has also done PhD. He is the director research of AVP Research Foundation in Coimbatore and the CEO of AVP Baltics, AVP's European Endeavor. He is also affiliated with University of Latvia as a university lecturer and research scholar. His primary areas of scientific interest in Ayurveda are clinical research and reverse pharmacology. After accomplishing a postgraduate degree in Dravyagun, Ayurved Pharmacology. He is currently pursuing doctoral research at the University of Latvia's Department of Molecular Biology with the goal of understanding and elucidating the molecular mechanisms underlying Ayurveda-based formulations for chronic diabetic wound healing. He is currently Principal Investigator for Integrative COVID Research Initiatives that are being undertaken on high-risk diabetes patients with moderate severe disease in partnership with the Stanley Medical College in Chennai and the PSG Medical College in Coimbatore. He is also interested in research on the uncommon genetic disorder which he collaborates with the University of Milan and uh, Ayush as a co-investigator. He is also co-investigator on clinical trial being conducted on collaboration with the University of Latvia to determine the efficacy of individualized Ayurvedic therapy in type 2 diabetes. He is also a member of author team that translated Ashtanga Rudayam into Latvian. Dr. Somit Kumar has been a practicing clinician for last 13 years and specializes in Panchakarma located in Kerala. His expertise spans the spectrum of metabolic, neuroendocrine, rheumatologic, dermatologic, and autoimmunity problems. Ayurveda's holistic approach informs his clinical consultations, which include nutrition, lifestyle recommendations, Ayurvedic medic medication, yoga, cognitive counseling therapy. He has been asked to speak at international seminars, academic 
uh, talks and consultations throughout the world, including Malaysia, Singapore, Brazil, Turkey, Slovenia, Hungary, Netherlands, Poland, Latvia, and Italy. He is a founding faculty member of AVP Training Academy, which offers regular short-term Ayurveda orientation sessions to the students from Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Japan, Switzerland, Switzerland, and Latvia. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Somit. Uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ashwini. Asavari. Uh, mm -hmm. Asavari, sorry. Uh, I, 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 I apologize for that. So Asavari ji. So it's, it's a uh, real pleasure to again, uh, kind of in collaborate with your uh, organization and uh, basic aim of today's interaction would be uh, to put forth the evidence-based uh, approach towards treating uh, diabetic food ulcer as well as uh, going a little deep into how you can understand from the reverse pharmacology approach. So as I've always been believing in uh, the core principles of Ayurveda is uh, undeterred. It cannot be changed. And any practice cannot deviate from uh, the core principles of Ayurveda. But what is also required is uh, document it and find out a possible reason which can be explained in so-called modern biomedicine. So that's why my core area of research is being in field of diabetes and its different complications. And today I'm going to share my whole experience in treating diabetic wound in India specifically, and also doing an in-depth analysis if these diabetic non-healing ulcers respond, how they respond, what is the possible mechanism of activity. Now, I understand that there are a lot of limitations in even in modern uh, modern biomedicine or molecular biology to define a complex therapy like multi drug model of ayurveda but it's always important that we at least touch few aspects of the whole complex intervention which is really remarkable but yes it builds a very primary understanding of how these were these uh, therapies work on these kind of situations. So, coming to my topic today, I would like to first throw a very uh, brief overview of uh, how diabetic foot ulcer becomes important and why we should, uh, as an Ayurveda practitioner. Um, feel there is a window of opportunity for us to integrate into uh, the whole management of diabetic uh, foot ulcer or non-healing diabetic foot ulcer. The first reason is that almost 60% of people who suffer from diabetic foot ulcer, they have repetition or reoccurrence of this diabetic foot. The second reason is almost 20% of the diabetic foot ulcer patient undergoes amputation. The third, the predisposition for having them having an early death becomes very high, even though you properly manage diabetic foot ulcer with the existing therapy. So whenever we talk about why Ayurveda, why should we think of integrating Ayurveda or Ayurveda um, uh, interventions into existing uh, modality of diabetic foot ulcer, we say there are certain gaps which we would like to uh, fill up. First, can we improve the recurrence rate or stop the recurrence to happen? Within three years, we see a lot of recurrence happens. Can we get less number of people getting 
their legs or limbs amputated? And can we improve overall quality of life and span or lifespan of diabetic patients? So these are the basic uh, background on which we would like to understand why Ayurveda has a role to play in the uh, integrative uh, therapy of diabetic foods. So for coming to this, I just want to very uh, basically brush upon how these diabetic food ulcers are different from not normal food ulcers. So is it different? See, wound is a wound. How is a diabetic wound different from a normal wound? So here you have to understand there is a bit of complexity that a diabetic wound is not always said to be as normal wound because of certain molecular uh, phenomena, which is different from a normal wound when you get either after an injury or after an abscess. So it is very important that to understand how it is different and how Ayurveda can help to address this specific abnormal uh, pathways which are more predominant in diabetic food ulcer, we can address through Ayurveda intervention, which can be internal medicine or external therapies. So if you look at the whole uh, etiopathogenesis, so first of all, you have high sugar level, of course, but that is not the only problem with diabetic food ulcer. There are a lot of people with high sugar level, but then the complexity comes when it is added with atherosclerosis, where the compromised blood flow happens in a particular area or a limb, then is the neuropathy. So a combination of high blood sugar, atherosclerosis, and polyneuropathy creates a state of suboptimal oxidation or suboptimal immune response in a specific area of your limb. And if there is a trauma or sometimes an infection from within where, which leads to an abscess or inflammation leading to abscess, because of these other reasons, basically atherosclerosis, uh, neuropathy, and high intensity of certain uh, cytokines and uh, free radicals, diabetic food ulcer becomes more difficult to treat more difficult for the response like as compared to normal uh, foot ulcers or other wound which may be there in non-diabetics. So if you look at second important challenge apart from neuropathy and high blood sugar and atherosclerosis and reduced blood supply in a particular area of limb, because of all these reasons, even the growth of micro bacterial microflora is very high. That means there are specific aerobic and anaerobic bacteria which grow much faster when you are diabetic and the wound are infected with specific kind of species. And among them, almost 50, more than 50% of bacterial species are staph aurens, which is a kind of gram negative uh, bacteria. And and, and then it creates a host of other complications. That means inflammation on one side and infection on the other side. So that's why diabetic food ulcer becomes a little complicated where you have to attack both infection and inflammation together. And if you look uh, from a modern perspective, many a times when you start high degree of antibiotics, which are multi-drug resistant, they don't respond. So what has been a major challenge also, which is coming forth is uh, there are strains of these bacteria, especially staph orange, which have become to uh, become resistant to existing uh, generation of antibiotics. So their response is suboptimal. And then what you have to do is basically, if there is a degree of gangrene, ischemia, then amputation follows. So these are challenges which we will have to. So whatever we define or decide in course of an Ayurveda therapy as an add-on or as a kind of, you know, 
uh, just uh, standalone therapy, you have to take these two factors in account. So as I told you that approximately 58% of, of the, you know, uh, diabetic foot ulcers are infected. Okay. And then if you lo look at the whole um, data that patients with diabetic frequently require minor and major lower limb imputation, it's kind of, you know, almost 15 to 27%. And more than 50% of cases, um, infection is a major factor. So you need to understand that uh, infection has to be controlled. And in Ayurveda, you know, many a times when you talk about antibiotics, we feel so uh, on the back foot that we, we, we think twice, do we have a strong uh, antibiotic? And this was one of the major challenge which I was uh, kind of facing during my uh, research work also as to what can we do for this major challenge when bacteria become disease kind of, you know, this uh, resistant to antibiotics. Can Ayurveda uh, come out and give some uh, kind of, you know, solution for it? So this was one of the also major insight from our research, which we have done at University of Latvia and at AVP Research Foundation. So we have been doing a lot of work on diabetic and diabetes related uh, kind of uh, complications. So <clears throat> what we see is, if you look at reoccurrence rate, as I was telling you in diabetic patient, within first three years, majority of patient who have a predisposition recurrence, as I told you, that means recurrence rates are very high. So around, if you look, uh, look at uh, almost 50% of the cases tends to reoccur even after the first uh, infection or first uh, uh, diabetic foot, foot ulcer, which is addressed either by lamp amputation or minor therapy, again, 50% of uh, case again, in fact, and creates a reoccurrence. So if you see what is the data, almost first three years, it reoccurs. So we have to see that, can we reduce this reoccurrence rate is a major area. Now, why this reoccurrence happens is, this is a normal healing diabetic, non-diabetic wood healing, uh, you know, uh, uh, molecular uh, pathway where you don't get so many macrophagic response that is your innate immune response. You don't have those VGA factor and other cytokines like IL-6, TNF-alpha. There are a lot of uh, infiltration of innate immunological cells which are more active in diabetic food rather than non-diabetic food. So if you look at that microphagic activity and related cytokine activity in the diabetic foot ulcer are very high. And there is disruption of collagen formation. So epithelization does not happen. And there is a lot of bacterial microflora in the <clears throat> infected diabetic food. So this is making a very a strong case where the healing does not happen or takes longer than a normal diabetic, uh, normal foot ulcer, which is in a non-diabetic cases. <coughs> so what Ayurveda has to offer? So if you go through the classics, almost uh, there are 60 different types of intervention. We all know about Sashti Upakrama or Sushuta. There are 60 methods of uh, addressing any wound and almost uh, if you do a literature survey, 164 medicinal plants have been told for wound healing activity, 24 different types of metals and minerals, and 18 different types of animal products. So if you look at, there is a strong uh, theoretical references of that Ayurveda has something to offer for wound healing. And specifically in diabetic food healing, if you look at Prameha Pitka is a very unique uh, reference gives though Prameha Pitka is not diabetic food ulcer, but some of these Prameha Pitka or diabetic abscess, carbuncles, 
turn into non-healing ulcer. So there is a strong reference of endogenous cause which could create diabetic foot ulcer. So first we have to understand foot ulcers can be uh, can happen because of an external injury, which because of neuropathy, you don't have the sensation, you have a hit, and then you don't realize it, and then you have infection, and then wound can happen. This is called as exogenous cause. But then endogenously also, you can have an inflammation and abscess, and that can turn into a diabetic foot ulcer, non-healing ulcer. This is where Ayurveda has already documented. So if you are taking both the causes, if you <clears throat> try to integrate the concept of Sashti Uprakamra from Sushruta as well as Prameha Pitka concepts from Charaka and Sushruta, everybody, you have a conceptual framework for treating diabetic foot ulcer in a very specific way. Now, I'm going to show you cases because it's no point uh, just discussing about uh, what is the theory. So, in this case, I am going to show you a case which is 66 year old non obese male. So generally, what we say, oh, diabetes is type two diabetes, and most of them are obese, you know. But no, many of the cases which are neuropathic in nature or highly, uh, they they may have a very. In this case, you see, at the time of admission, he had a very good BMI for 24.86, HbA1c absolutely normal, but still he had a reoccurring non-healing wound. That means, and it is reoccurring. That means if you see at the history in the last one and a half year, he had one episode. And after that, he undergoes an um, amputation, partial amputation, debridement of one of the two. And in spite of having a good uh, glucose control, having a good BMI, still there is reoccurrence of diabetic food. That means definitely you can't say that people, uh, he, this case uh, uh, is a failure to oral hypoglycemic drug or insulin. No, they are responding in terms of sugar. So they have extremely good hypoglycemic or uh, glycemic control. But where the problem is, as we all know, that diabetes is not merely a disorder of glucose metabolism. It is a inflammatory disease and endothelial dysfunction. Your own innate immune response creates a uh, innate inflammatory response, which creates this. So we have seen many people, you know, they have very absolutely good sugar control, but suffering from neuropathy, retinopathy and nephropathy. Why? Because we eventually keep in sugar in good control, but we were never keeping our inflammation, this low grade inflammation, which is the real cause of diabetes under control. So for this, you have to little go deeper into molecular mechanism of type two diabetes because all diabetics are not insulogenic. You will be surprised that 70% of the people have almost normal insulin secretion, but still they are diabetic because of insulin resistance or lower insulin sensitivity, other, met other metabolic issue where insulin secretion is normal, but still your glucose level gets altered. Why? Because of it also contributing factor of endothelial dysfunction, which is cause of atherosclerosis, which is cause of high sugar levels. Now, this is where you have to understand, in this case highlights, you can have perfect sugar levels, but still you can have reoccurrence of diabetic foot ulcer as well. Why? Because also he had a, a very uh, strong neuropathic symptoms. If you see tingling sensation and on the whole, when the patient comes to you is having a low grade fever, that means there is septicemia, some degree of septicemia, which is creating a, a strong uh, autoimmune response, macrophagic response, which is creating a low grade fever. So, and there are already a necrotic cyst issue. So the patient came to me in, uh, 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 in 2014 on 18th, uh, and then he presents a necrotic tissue. Now with all the symptoms of uh, uh, inflammation and infection, secondary infection is there because there is a putrid smell, pass, 
discharge and you can see the uh, necrotic tissues uh, there is a gangrene and if you see if you see one of the toe is missing out of five only four are there so this is definitely a case where existing therapy has sobbed optimally helped him so here this is where we have to think of integration because that is when people come to you they don't come to you when they would have got simple diabetic fault ulcer when they have tried every means they have tried uh, all the uh, kind of you know uh, uh, regular uh, conventional medicine with plastic uh, uh, plastic surgery and everything everything rejected then they come to you so this is where this is also happening so how do you treat but yes answer is that it will not happen in one so it took 8 months for us to completely achieve this so first important thing is you need to have patience and second thing you should have enough experience of treating many patient where you could give realistic timelines you know people come to you oh my diabetic foot ulcer how much how many days it will take people say oh one month i do, i have not found out i have uh, treated so many diabetic foot ulcer if you and in this case we didn't give any antibiotic nothing we managed solely with ayurvedic therapy yes there are regular uh, anti diabetic medication oral hypoglycemic drugs were continued no antibiotics was given in this case and we could in 8 months bring back the reepithelization now if you amputate uh, you will have scar tissue but if you see in this case it was so unique that this reoccurring diabetic wound once it healed you just see it just like uh, god's uh, plastic surgery so the, when epithelialization takes place so this is necrotic tissue then hyper uh, granulation happens this will always happen in any um, healing ulcer first there will be hyper granulation see and this new healthy granulation tissue eats up the dead tissue you don't have to cut anything the healthy granulation tissue itself by macrophagic activity or other method of phagocytosis it eats up the dead tissue you see how it is covering and then once it eats up the dead tissue hyper uh, uh, kind of you know uh, proliferation of these uh, uh, cells which you are seeing again it subsides and then epithelialization takes place and then you have a continuous non disrupted Uh, cutaneous layer formed now if you see it was not achieved in one day so if you see uh, he was in 2013 diagnosed by 14 diagnosed in 2013 but you know if he had already ulceration and necrosis in 2014 first time that means he would have already had the sugar from long time but he was not diagnosed diabetic so it was Uh, a late diagnosis in this case uh, then it reoccurred in july first attempt of diabetic food within one year it reoccurrence happened july uh, his amputation of second toe happened and reoccurred again late in october 2014 as i told you this is where as i was telling you data that maximum reoccurrence in these diabetic foot ulcer happens within 3 years so can we address this issue is this and then again necrosis and all so what we did so we did as i told you a multi drug therapy model if you look at uh, so we do give internal medicine so i would like to state that whatever we have achieved throughout 8 months is through uh, internal medicine as well as external therapy so internally we have over time and again came out with an algorithm of certain specific drugs uh, or combination especially mahamanjishtadi as one of the one of the best combination which has to be given in diabetic foot ulcer specifically of neuropathic nature now why i'm trying to tell you even in modern uh, uh, kind of a biomedicine you have different scoring for a diabetic wound and a non diabetic uh, diabetic wound with neuropathy and a diabetic wound without neuropathy so if you look at from that perspective if you see manjishtadi kasham is specifically told in suptata in prameha which has a suptata leading to a vrana also and uh, prameha pitka has been clearly indicated in the um, the text so what we have found that mahamanjishtadi seems to be a frontline medicine 
classical Ayurveda therapy, which works in terms of all the stages of the womb, whether it is Shuddha Vrana. Now, here, if you look at very classically, uh, so first, first two stages you see it's a Dushta Vrana. We have a lot of Kuya, Puti and all that tissue. So they are Dushta Vrana. And then when all the granulation tissue forms, then it becomes a Shuddha Vrana. Now, in this case, Mahamanji study, what stage we should give? What we have found out that this is a combination which you can give in both the stage for wound healing. But yes, certain other concomitant medicine you have to change according to the stage of the medicine. Why? Because where we have found that when you have septicemic nature, mild septicemia or infection, patol katolhnayadi kashayam, mulakadi kashayam, aragvadhadi kashayam and kaishor guglu. This inherently goes. And if, uh, suppose they have fever, we have given Vettu Maran Gulika, uh, Shaddharana Churnam, which are basically, if you see if the type of therapy, so you have a first Dushtavarana stage and then Shuddhavarana stage, where the combination changes. So, if you ask me, will Manjist, Maha Manjistadi just take care? It may basically take care of wound healing, but it may not take care of associated secondary infection, which may be strong. So you have to opt based on dosha or symptom based on either patol kadunyadi or uh, aragvadhadi with mulakadi or guduchyadi. Uh, if a lot of fever, you have to add petumara and another thing. So it depends on uh, what is availability uh, and your choice of drug can be uh, uh, taken in court. But there is a differently an approach which we have uh, replicated in many cases um, with minimum uh, kind of customization based on other associated comorbidity or symptom. One important thing what we have seen is Jatyadi use of Jatyadi Tailam as external therapy and Jatyadi Gritam. So I think across the spectrum, when you have more Vata and Kapha symptoms, Taila Prayoga is important when there is more Vata and Pitta symptoms, Grita Prayoga is important. So we make that differentiation. And here we have basically used uh, more uh, because it was Ma Vata and Kapha symptoms. We have used here is uh, right now uh, Jatyadi Tailam. And uh, also if neuropathic nature are high, the Tailam uh, responds better. Now, as part of Sasti Upakrama, uh, there are also upakramas where we do prachalana, uh, like, you know, washing of the wounds, dhupana, uh, and then avachurnana. So put a, like drying the wound with some uh, powders. And here we have a very unique combination and all of them are classical. So in at AVP, we have been very clear that we use very classical medicine where you don't have patency over whatever you are using. It's just the thought, which is more important rather than just combination. How do you put together? And we have found out is a classical medication called Nambadi Churnam. It's excellent for Avuchurnanam. When you are dusting the wound, it's excellent antimicrobial. Uh, it takes off uh, kind of, you know, any cleda or any uh, dead tissues and uh, pus uh, generation. And then Trifala Churnam, of course, is also uh, used for washing, the washing the wound. So this is where is very simple uh, uh, combinations, but it's of great use. And uh, it's not just, I'm telling you because of one case, now we have been repeating or replicating the same model in diabetic neuropathic uh, cases, and we have been getting very, and I, I see in your, uh, in, in US also, you are getting Manjista, the Karha, Quat tablets or Manjista as unique, and Kaishor Google is very much available. So I think these are very important, um, therapies which you have to resort not only diabetic wound i'm seeing suptata means diabetic neuropathy why do you wait for even waiting for uh, a wound to happen even when you have neuropathic symptom maha manjistadi manjistadi kaishor gugula combination is doing wonders so we 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 are trying to make a very evidence based algorithm in this case so as i told you there are different methods of uh, kind of you know uh, Telling whether there is a change. Like, for example, here I have used as CHS wound grade scale. 
So somebody asked me, okay, are you treated a diabetic foot ulcer? But uh, tell me what stage it was. You must have treated some diabetic foot ulcer, which you would have treated or not. It would have healed on its own. So you need to understand, you need to stage it properly and make a correct assessment of the uh, severity of the condition. So we use CHS wound uh, grade scale for diabetic and how it is derived is basically for diabetic foot, neuropathic foot ulcer scale. So you can go online and talk, uh, see about what it is and basically what we say, how you grade it. So we found that the wound which we are um, uh, treating was of grade five because uh, it was a lot of necrotic tissues and wound, okay? So it was of grade four. And then uh, if you look at what is the data suggesting, if somebody comes with this scale, of five, what is their kind of, you know, average duration of wound healing? If suppose uh, somebody asks, uh, what should be the average uh, duration of the wound healing? So if you look at, uh, if you have a grade uh, kind of, you know, of five, there is 78% chance that it will not heal, you know? So it's called as, uh, it, this is a very nice paper you all can go through. So it talks about taking 72,525 wounds cases. They have come out with a data stating that if some wound comes with a grade of five, there is 78.7% .7 chance that it may not heal. So again, you we can argue with a single case that yes, it may be in those uh, 22% of cases which could have healed. Okay, it could have healed. But then we have seen that there was reoccurrence and then healing uh, taking uh, kind of place. And second, again, one important thing what is uh, there that how long this uh, kind of, you know, diabetic foot ulcer takes it to heal. If you see there's age wise, he was 65 around uh, 64. That means 48% chances not heal. Uh, based on the area and uh, other uh, grading. Again, there are different uh, kind of, you know, chances, percentage, but it will not heal. So these are very important uh, criteria. We will have to see the prognosis. Now, uh, we have to say that, yes, if we have treated this case, it is worth showing as a case because of X, Y reason. Okay. So a simple wound is... Anybody can heal, but uh, what today world is looking for Ayurveda is where it can be integrated, where there are a lot of challenges with the existing methodology. Another case is non-neuropathic. This is a, a non-neuropathic wound. Now you will say, what is the fun in this? This is non-neuropathic and then, but if you look at the whole uh, kind of, you know, if you see non-neuropathic within four months, it heals but that took almost eight months. So there is definitely a neuropathic and non-neuropathic wound takes a different time to heal. And you can see, again, this case was having gangrene. Uh, it was subjected to uh, amputation. They were, they were telling to amputate and all the symptoms of, you know, uh, necrotic, offensive, stale uh, smell, even fever with chill was there. In this case also, uh, it was having, and but here you can see his sugar levels were very high, 9.5. So in this case, it's a typical uh, hypermetabolic syndrome that is hyperglycemia leading to uh, infl inflammation, infection, gangrene, necrosis, secondary infection, you have to treat. Now here, if you look at the use of uh, Manjistadi or Maha Manjistadi is there, here, Aragvadadi, Patol Koronadi, almost you can see again the same uh, category of usage. Kaishor Guglu again goes there, but use of Punarnavadi Puna Kashayam, where there is uh, inflammation uh, is there. We are giving more Punarnavadi, Yashopha, abscess is very important. So that we give. And then use of Shivagulika. See, one important perspective of, uh, you know, Silajatu. If not Shivaguluka, Silajit, Prayoga is very important, use of Silajitu throughout the 
uh, therapy or at least after the infective phase, if you start uh, use of uh, Shivagulika or Shilajitu, also it gives along with uh, Ashwagandha Prayoga here we have done. And a lot of work has gone like Daijit and Amrita Churnam work, which are basically and uh, reducing the hypoglycemia, uh, the hyperglycemia to create a sugar level. So in this case, the approach is a little different, not just limited to neuropathy, inflammation, infection. Here we have a broader approach. And here what we see, the patient comes with 9.5 baseline within four months, 6.6. .6. It's almost, and uh, the patient is not on antibiotics, just overall hypoglycemic drug. Initially when patient came, yes, he, they were put on high insulin. And then uh, within due course of three weeks, he was put on insulin and then we could with our therapy. Now, what we have seen in our uh, personal, because we are now having a separate wound healing clinic, we see a lot of people who are on both allopathy and Ayurveda therapy, especially insulin dependent. We see certain drop in, in uh, glucose level. And it's sometimes very difficult to convince people to reduce allopathic medicine. So uh, when you opt for doing an integrative therapy, please be very careful with insulin patient. Ra oral hypoglycemic drugs, we don't have bigger challenges, but insulin therapy who are on, we see sudden drastic um, uh, reduction in insulin levels, uh, sorry, uh, sugar levels. And sometimes they go into hypoglycemic shock sometimes. So uh, we are now through our experiences are taking extra care of. Here, if you have a non neuropathic wound, you have a different DUSS scale where you have to see and score it in a different way. And based on this scale, if you see whether there's a bone probing, palpable pedal pulse is there, ulcer side, ulcer number, based on that, we give the score. And this particular score, of course, it was grade two, but we say that, yeah, this particular case had a better prognosis than last case, but yes. But then the patient was for what we did, we had saved from amputation and there's no reoccurrence till now right from 2018. So that window period of three years is, we have been able to manage better with Ayurveda integration. Customized therapy again, as I told you, is very important. Now, we have seen these cases, but how does it work? And this is where we need to go a little deeper into mechanism of activity. So what we did was we started using this at least internal medicine is a complex process. We started doing little work on uh, Jatyadi Telam and Jatyadi Ghrita uh, combination on the cell activity. And recently I got published in uh, uh, one of the leading uh, journals with uh, uh, kind of impact factor of almost 2.6 now. So here we have uh, tried to show uh, how this Jatyadi Telam and Jatyadi uh, uh, Grita formulation works. You'd be surprised that they both are two different combinations. Now, one Jatyadi Thailam is combination which is Kerala specific and only three drugs are common. Other combinations are totally different and it's from South of India. But when you did GCMS, you found a similar kind of... So, you know, I was surprised that this substitution, we say Abhav and Pratinidhi the in Ayurveda, we give based on Rasaguna Viriya Vipaka, but also it matches the <laughs> chemical profile. So when I did this as part of my uh, research, I was thinking, you know, only three drugs are common. So we will get totally different GC profile or SPTLC profile. But to my surprise, just imagine this North Indian formulation of Jatyadi Gritam and South Indian formulation specifically of Jatyadi Thailam they were substituted based on this concept of Rasaguna Vipaka and chose totally different drug except three, but we found a similar profile. This is quite intriguing. Then I did an HPTLC. And when we did an HPTLC uh, markers also, we found, of course, uh, AVP and uh, both of them, but major bands where we, we ran the end-to-end, Major bands were say, same, but yeah, minor differences were there. But what we saw that phytochemically, they are not big changes. So 
it's again a very important uh, reassurance for our whole concept of that when we identify based uh, any herb based on rasaguna viria parka may also have some phytochemical background to it so whenever we are talking about this concept of abhava and pratinidhi please don't treat any abhava or substitute as adulterant this is a common mentality these days oh this is and use that uh, substitute so it is adulterant no there may be some uh, scientific phenomena and through this our research we have proven that there is some phytochemical perspective behind it also now second challenge i was talking to you about is how do we okay it was working in clinics i showed you now how did it work as i told you in inflammation in reducing infection so first we took that this scene this two formulation for understanding how it is reducing infections so what we took is we took staph aureus uh, bacteria sorry there are two slides which has got mixed uh, so here it's a phytochemical parameter uh, which is kind of you know we have high level of flavonoids terpenoids and all those things um less anthocyanins of course we took this uh, derived uh, from oil we took out all the phytochemicals by uh, extraction method and then we gave it into a dilution method and we checked whether it inhibited the growth of this bacteria or not it's called micro dilution and what we found out especially with mrsa multi drug resistant staph aureus where gentamicin and streptomycin did not do any control ayurvedic drugs like you know this two formulation you know jatya the uh, south indian version was in fact little more effective than uh, jatya the which was told in the um, uh, afi in fact so i, I think uh, you know uh, somehow but anti inflammatory activity we found out in uh, yoga grantha anti inflammatory was little more than um, uh, the uh, uh, south indian version yeah little difference but they were not uh, uh, totally opposite so both of them had uh, inhibitions yes but one what thing what we saw they were effective on more on certain strain which are uh, more properly known in uh, kind of you know, diabetic foot ulcer other uh, uh, bacteria like enterococcus physalis or uh, uh, pseudomonas which are there in uh, large intestine and all they were not very effective in it so we found that that bacteria which were more popularly found in uh, diabetic foot ulcers were effective kind of you know this both the formulations were effective this is i am showing you a real case we got this uh, lady she is again uh, around 70 years the wound seems to be very simple for you isn't it because it's a small wound in the but where it is there it is just on the heel heel because of your pressure of the body the wound here does not heal very easily because every day you stand you crush the epithelial layer and it gets uh again a open wound second thing was she was not responding to any antibiotic so she is a classical case of multi drug resistant uh, bacteria uh, like you know condition where she had this staph aureus which was multi drug resistant we started treating it again it took 6 months this same small wound took us 6 months almost 6 uh, months means uh, Uh, june to november yeah june july august september october november yeah six months almost N november 21 i this is a november 21 uh, picture and this is june 21 picture it took a six months such a small wound but then we could heal it completely and in fact this lady had undergone so many cycles of higher antibiotic and in fact she developed such a high degree of gut dysbiosis she was suffering from irritable bowel syndrome because continuously she was for 3 years on antibiotics because this wound was there reoccurring for 3 years and the bacteria was not responding to any antibiotics now the issue is what we found out in our lab we could 
now my work was done before this i was treating this case but when this case came to me i was a little more confident to treat because i had already found out that this will work may work or then now once i'm treating these cases it is working so what we found out in lab also is working with the same perspective same challenges in a clinic so i have showed you both the examples in uh, from clinic to lab and from lab to clinic how you can keep on uh, understanding now as i told you one important factor when you are proving a case is successful or not is you have to explain the metabolic or uh, or also uh, molecular pathway so cytokines play an important role in this and we studied all the cytokines important which are more predominant only in diabetic foot ulcers not in normal ulcers il6 tnf alpha il uh, 1 beta mcp1 all these things what we have seen which is expressed in a diabetic foot ulcer we found that these two herbal combinations has a very important uh, effect on this so and also what we found out is in star forens it is very effective those formulation and also in biofilm making see biofilm uh, making bacteria is very uh, important to note that when the bacteria make a biofilm it does not allow any chemical to go and penetrate and kill the bacteria or alter the bacterial genome our therapies can also do that because of i don't know how but we don't know one chemical because there is host of chemicals but somehow it is able to penetrate in this so when we are doing this research we didn't just so the first one is only relative gene expression here means we put this uh, combinations in cells we see whether the particular cytokine genes are expressed now many a case we see genes will express but it will not form a protein which will actually fight the inflammation so we went up to the protein expression we didn't just do a gene expression that this jatyadi telam and jatyadi uh, ghrita do impact the fibroblast of your cell dna of your so what we are trying to tell you is whatever we are giving is working at molecular level at dna level in expressing these uh, cytokine or suppressing this cytokine so if you don't give your medicine the cytokines are very high when you start giving your and dose dependent see 50 has a better inhibition than 10 so what we have proved that at genetic level there is an impact and then we went up to the uh expression at the protein level and we found out even at protein level the same expression we can see and we see that all the cytokines which are more predominant in uh, kind of in all these uh, diabetic foot ulcers can be inhibited by these external therapies now why i want to highlight this because seeing the global perspective it will take some time for us to Uh, create lot of clinical trials to allow our internal medicine to be expect accepted as a front line approach to treating such condition but what we can immediately start is external therapies so that's why we have targeted our external therapies first to create evidence for both clinical and non clinical evidence to state that what we are talking does work not only in lab but also in the clinic so that's why we talk about uh, sharing our experiences of these and so what we say that we have a team so i, I just want to also say that this work what we have done is with our collaboration so this is another important and this uh, particular forum is also very important because this forum talks about collaboration of multi uh, uh, stakeholders partners so this study was done with partners our research partners at university of latvia we have uh, dr professor pirax who's my guide at phd guide as well as my colleagues uh, ilona uh, then we have cynthia then we have uh, uh, baiba we have also professor zubuzo pops so all of them uh, and also um, tatiana uh, they all have 
work in a uh, so uh, some are microbiologists some are bio uh, molecular biologists some are endocrinologists some are statisticians so we and and uh, of course dr zupops is a uh, a surgeon so we all worked in a multidisciplinary team to create this uh, uh, thing so whatever we are publishing so our first publication is out uh, we are there to publish two more articles and many other case studies which we are doing based on this study so what we are trying to create is a a, a thought process of evidence based practice and reverse pharmacology where both science and shastra the classical thought process knowledge of traditional complementary approach has to be also scientifically um, revalidated but yes i don't say at the cost of our basic principle being compromised but we can still create unique models of studying different phenomena so this is in the short which i wanted to share today with all of you and uh, hope uh, it will be of some insight thank you thank you for council of ayurveda research to give me this opportunity thank you thank you so much dr sumit it was absolutely excellent presentation you explained uh, diabetic food ulcers so wonderfully and also the pathology behind diabetes and how it is different that uh, you know the non diabetic versus the diabetic ulcers so this was extremely helpful i'm sure that all of our viewers will benefit a lot with this so i had uh, you know few questions uh, so <clears throat> i'm just wondering about uh, these diabetic ulcers so like they can be anywhere on the skin also and they can be also on the foot so is there any difference or have you seen any diabetic ulcers on anywhere on the body yeah so anywhere on the body uh, they we have seen only carbuncles like for example if it is on hands or on the back or so basically we have seen more uh, carbuncles non healing ulcers not because because basically non healing ulcers happens on dependal parts where there is a pressure so basically foot seems to be most uh, vulnerable place where this all shin sometimes if it happens in shin of the tibia it's very mm -hmm. difficult again because there is very less supply of uh, blood in there so uh, other parts you get but it can be easily treatable because of uh, vicinity to central uh, circulatory uh, like you know system as well mm -hmm. as carbuncles we have been finding out more into this area but most challenging is diabetic foot that's why dfu they have specifically classified as diabetic foot ulcers where pressure neuropathy because of being a peripheral uh, organ of your body spell as uh, many other factors where you don't have enough uh, peripheral circulation giving adequate immunological response to an inflammation and infection so all this make it more vulnerable so precisely saying other area uh, we get very less or if it is there also is easily treatable uh, and more we found find out in other areas more we what we find out is carbuncles not non healing ulcers sure okay makes sense thank you so much just give me a second yeah sorry about that uh, i just have one more question and i was wondering about if there was any dietary protocol uh, in order to reduce or you know address the and in, inflammation that is the underlying factor in these cases yes yeah, so i have been very particular about diet the first thing what we have to uh, talk about is we should not give any diet which is kleda karaka that which creates kleda Uh, in mm -hmm. terms of which could be both increasing your inflammation so you have to give anti inflammatory diet as well as uh, the kleda in ayurveda is also a very important factor for bacterial and uh, viral growth so 
the first thing which immediately we talk about is first dadhi anu prasapayam si navan napanam guda vaikritam cha so all ever whatever has told been prameha so specifically milk products especially yogurt um, we tell them to get off especially in the night so what uh, what we have found out is today we all talking about calorie restriction circadian rhythm and everything but we do intermittent fasting and calorie restriction in a not, uh, wrong way so i hear many people talking about you know you have your last meal at 12 in the night so next day at 2 o'clock if you are doing then it's a good intermittent fasting or calorie restriction but that's not the way ayurveda works out so you have to do intermittent fasting but align with the circadian rhythm of the sunrise and sunset so first thing what if you want to reduce kledha you have to make your dinner very uh, light preferably vegan and uh, high fiber vegetarian uh, non protein diet now i may sometimes sound controversial no protein in the night yes why i say is because if you look at protein from an ayurvedic perspective except mudga or masura mm-hmm. most of the proteins are heavy guru when you have a sunset your agni goes down so that's why we have talked about that eat early or by sunset and your dinner should be the most light test uh, serving of your whole day isn't it you have to have light dinner so even if you take a small amount of protein which is guru it will not get digested and will lead to kledha so when it is not getting digested it will lead to kledha or it will lead to acidity and inflammatory response and again if you see amino acid see protein breaks into amino acid fat breaks into fatty acid but most of the vegetables are fiber rich and they are not breaking to x y z acidic media so it does not create a, a ground for acidic nature in your system so what i specifically advise all my diabetic patient to only stick to vegetarian vegetable food which are like cucurbits like you have bitter gourd bottle gourd snake gourd squash zucchini all these vegetables which are good for diabetics or uh, like you know okra or lady's finger what you say different kinds of gourds cucurbits with very low fib low calorie rich fiber rich carbs like it can be a whole grain um, barley or buckwheat or quinoa or something like that just stick to that in the night this itself i have seen people reducing the amount of kledha or the amount of uh, hyper inflammatory environment which your body has first thing mm-hmm. but i don't have to give lot of drugs for reducing a sugar the moment the people stick to this now whatever protein you want you take it in your breakfast or lunch because that's where you can digest it well but yes if you are diabetic you have to be very clear that ground rules i tell them definitely avoid sheep food people argue a lot omega 3 fatty acid is good for peripheral circulation this and that i don't believe in that our ayurvedic text have very clearly anuprasa payamsi anuprasa has mm-hmm. to be taken off i tell them to stop taking any seafood any fish any uh, uh, any animal which is in the water i don't tell them to take that then gramya gramya all poultry and all those things which are farmed farmed mm-hmm. meat you need to avoid that so these are very basic things which i have been doing with my patient and i have been very successful in uh, reducing their hbo1c and with proper diet and internal medicine as we have already discussed it's very s- simple not very variable but almost all the spectrum i have to talk we are able to manage it well absolutely amazing i'm sure this um, this webinar will be very helpful for everybody to you know understand different perspectives and great collaboration of modern medicine as well as ayurveda Uh, we do have a lot of uh, avp products here actually uh, in the united states 
<clears throat> due to the globalization the things have become so much easier yes yeah, so i don't know i'm not here to kind of endorse avp's product or anything but as yeah because i am a researcher uh, primarily and as practitioner so i just wanted to share see at avp we have always believed in that uh, uh, the usp or unique uh, uh, ethos of avp under krishna kumar ji's vision was to mm -hmm. share what we have learned and that's why we are one of the first institution in world which got nih grant national institute of health grant you know mm -hmm. and we did the first ever rheumatoid arthritis project studied it scientifically we published it and we are in fact started the second version we are doing a multi centric trial now indian government is supporting it but so what why i wanted this uh, kind of you know i agreed also today because see for us what is important is what we have through our clinical experience we can share with at large there is nothing to hide because whatever is there is the uh, intellectual property of ayurveda of not individuals mm -hmm. we are just an instrument for uh, you know uh, bringing that into our clinical uh, practice so this is very important that people can be confident that it's not based on anecdotal evidences so again i will tell you it is not anecdotal evidences we have several mm -hmm. cases i don't i would have shown you almost many more cases which we have documented is under publication so mm -hmm. it is very well documented and what we have shared is only uh, where we are sure it works it's not just uh, kind of uh, giving some wild thought <laughs> absolutely amazing thank you so much again and i will uh, upload this webinar uh, to our car youtube channel thank you so and much thank you so much again my pleasure